Okay, welcome to this week's charting analysis webinar with myself, Jasper Lawler. Quite an interesting start to the week because we've uh, just had China's GDP report. We've got the ECB later on this week. We'll soon dig into that. For the time being, we're just going to dig through these uh, these risk warning screens. <coughs> Any questions at all, please feel free to send them through the, the chat or Q&A dialogue boxes, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to oblige. You know, even if it's just a slightly more obscure market you want to comment on, <coughs> um, or some specific event or particular pattern maybe that you were looking at within some of the more prominent assets that we trade, um, you know, feel free to just let me know. So not that much in the way of uh, economic data this week. <coughs> As I mentioned, the um, the, the uh, interest rate decision from the European Central Bank could be an interesting one. Um, my take is that most likely they're not going to announce um, extra QE per month. And they're also fairly unlikely, I would say, to uh, to extend the duration of the policy. You know, we're only, you know, we're not that far into the policy at the moment, and um, uh, you know, we're only a few months in, and I don't think that the current state of markets, although a bit cautious, is not the outright state of panic that preceded the previous meeting, and uh, no, no action was taken then. The only reason to believe that there there could be some action taken, and and why we're looking on this euro chart at yet another false break of this long-term triangle pattern is because inflation has dropped into the negative again in the eurozone and so really officially speaking um, as some of the, the ECB members have alluded to um, the, the European Central Bank as of the moment is not actually meeting its target um, and not even getting close in fact its target is uh, inflation just below 2% inflation's declining now the problem is that most of the reason for that decline in inflation is uh, is oil prices. Core inflation is actually hold, holding pretty steady, and that's that's the inflation that strips out oil prices. So, you know, if they were to ease policy, um, it would be a very dovish signal because really it's it's fighting a force that they can't really in themselves um, combat. You know, it's a commodity-related decline in prices. Um, but just looking at this chart, uh, I've been focusing a lot on the weekly chart on the, on the euro dollar at the moment, just because we keep getting these false breakouts of this um, uh, this triangle pattern. It's not so easy to see on the on the on the daily price chart. Nonetheless, I've, I've highlighted this uh, weekly reversal here, the dip and the close below this this triangle as I see it. And then if we do drop down to that daily candlestick chart, you can see that we had a what is fairly close to a bearish engulfing candlestick um, pretty much covers it the body is slightly is about the same um, but uh, quite a big reversal that we saw on uh, on the Thursday and that's followed through on Friday and today and to my mind you know when you see a false break um, you know a failure at the 115 level again and a false break of this triangle pattern to me suggests that the psychology is that we're probably going to have to go and retest the 111 and see if we can get through there before we make another run higher. Um, we, it's really range bound conditions, and so that you know we could find support in and around this kind of what is something akin to the previous resistance in that 113 area uh, and then make a surge out of the triangle again. but. My suspicion is that we drop a bit further back into into the range because it's not quite certain where we're going. Obviously, the ECB is the big factor here. If, I, if, I, if as, as I say, the ECB actually doesn't really do much, then you know that would be a positive for euro dollar. And um, the only other factor at play here is is what's said and done by the Federal Reserve. That you know we don't have a Fed meeting um, coming just yet. Uh, we've got non-farm payrolls, um, but uh, you know the Fed meeting is um, is next week, so yeah, that's, that's still a, a fair bit away. 
So, you know, it's it's really kind of um, I, I, my feeling is that probably we can't get out of this range until we hear more from the from the Fed. But uh, you know, at the moment, risk is skewed to the downside in the euro because of that ECB meeting coming up. Now, the other factor that was in that's kind of in play today, and why we're seeing, uh, you know, according to our charts, um, a slight drop in these European pairs, but actually most of them, the European markets themselves, like Germany, the German DAX and the French CAC, are, um, as the cash prices would suggest, slightly higher. Um, and but it's just the it's the, it's the FTSE 100. Um, or as we trade it, the UK 100, that's um, a bit lower today. And that's kind of because of this Chinese GDP report. As you can see here over on the right of my screen, it's these um, heavily weighted commodity stocks that are kind of dragging down the rest of the index. <laughs> so without wishing to jump around too much, just while I'm talking about that, let's pull up the, uh, the UK 100. A lot of these, uh, you know, the, I've been saying it for a, a few of these past webinars, a lot of these... Um, Global indices are looking kind of similar because it's it's uh, concerns over Chinese growth and the Chinese currency devaluation that pushed them lower, and they're all kind of dealing with the same global factors. Some showing more strength than others, but generally moving kind of in tandem. Uh, and, and so this chart looks a little bit busy, but let me just focus your attention on the main bits, which is if we're looking at a weekly chart, it's made a a higher low and then a higher high. So that's characteristic of an uptrend. We've dropped back down from that higher high, down to the breakout area, in around this um, 6260. Bound, rebounded strongly, but then stalled a bit at this 6400. So obviously, where we are now is: do we do we continue up towards a bit of resistance from this broken trend line on the long-term chart, and indeed to the 61.8 percent Fib retracement? <coughs> Um, and indeed to these highs up here, and, you know, this is the kind of various w barriers that we have to cross if prices are to, to move higher through this big decline that we had. Um, or is it here, or maybe at one of these high resistance levels, that this correction ends and uh, we roll over? And there's a possibility that we can't even get through this high from Friday and that we roll down into a, um, a lower price and try and pick up more buyers interested at lower prices and around 6,000 round number again. You know, I haven't drawn it in yet, it's only two, two uh, prices, but if we do get a drop down here, I'll be keeping an eye on a rising trend line connecting these two lows. But at the moment, this is kind of the resistance area, this um, just beneath the, uh, the 6,500. Now I'll pull up the the U.S. 30 chart because that that's the, probably the strongest of the bunch. We're obviously in the midst of U.S. earnings season at the moment. Just had some bad results from Morgan Stanley. The results from the banks have been a bit mixed, but most of the investment banks have been kind of disappointing, and that's kind of the thought process around earnings at the moment. There's a bit of a focus around the banks, and hasn't been all that great. A lot of the kind of market volatility from August actually has played into it. Uh, normally, volatility is a good thing for trading, but um, you know the volatility was in and around the the stock markets mostly, and uh, people have been frightened out a bit of the uh, bond markets, which tends to generate the most um, profits for some of these banks. So, US 30, you can see similar kind of deal, where we've broken through this uh, what was the 50% Fibonacci, having stalled there, we're now up into the 61.8. We did come back a bit from there, now we're up and above it, right on it, I mean up and above the previous peak, right on that FIB level now. Same deal where we're making higher highs and higher lows. Appear to have broken out of this bearish RSI zone, so we made a, you know, an oversold level. And typically once you break back through the kind of 60, you know, then, then we're more into the vicinity of... Um, looking at a buying market. We haven't moved into that overbought area yet to characterize more bullish trend in the market. That would be a stronger signal, but obviously that would typically involve us being at higher prices. For the time being, we're still below the 60, uh, still below the 70 overbought, and we're still below the 200-day moving average. So there's going to be reticence about buying as we approach the underside, the underside of that 200-day moving average. A lot of people have a rule 
they won't um, they won't they won't uh, buy below the 200, and they won't sell above it. So while that's the case, you know we're sort of limiting the um, you know the possibility upside. And it's been a good run higher. You know, then we're certainly the higher we get, the more worry there is going to be that we that we roll over. And so I've highlighted this um, this level here, which I think was first marked out by that low, um, sort of false breaked and challenged here, chopped around here, and then finally broke through um, in August. So I think that could be an area to watch out for. And obviously, just beneath that 200 day, which at the moment sits quite well with that that peak on August 18th. Um, we've also got some lows back here, which I had a trend line drawn in do at the moment so um, you know, that's just in the nature of beast when we're pushing up into an uptrend but it's uh, at the moment we're not into clear skies we're, we're going up against these previous previous areas all of which can cause either small or large corrections um, you've just got to make a decision which way the, the trend is going the moment the trend is up that's where your buyer should be but you've just got to be cautious because we are below that 200 day moving average now European markets actually looking a bit softer, which um, goes slightly counter to the idea that there could be some more QE in the line. Um, now this is the the Germany 30, you know, our proxy for the, the 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 DAX, and as you can see here, we've not even got close to these um, September peaks that we pushed through in the UK and the and the um, uh, the, the US. I think part of that is that you know um, part of these gains in U.S. and U.K. indices have been born on uh, a bit of return to strength in commodities, and there are some prominent oil and gas and mining companies in the U.S. and U.K., um, particularly the U.K., but um, not so much in in Europe. Um, we've got Total, who I think are actually reporting earnings this week in France, but. Um, Nonetheless, that you know that the the bounce in commodities has not helped um, European markets as much as it has um, the UK and the US. And there's still you know, sort of the sort of German exporters, you know, the car makers. Um, obviously, Volkswagen is prominent at the moment. Are all not looking quite so good um, with the slowdown in China because that's been a big big market for them. So I think those exporters are sort of drag on the. European markets, um, whereas the commodity shares have been a bit of a boon for the UK and US. So, you know, if we do get a push through this this resistance area um, in the Germany 30, I think that'll be a little trigger for for even uh, another run higher in the the other UK and US indices as well. And that's you know that's a bit of a sort of barrier I think to global markets pushing higher as this this area in the, the Germany 30 and uh, the equivalent looking ones in the French CAC and Euro 50. French 30, Euro 50. French 40, sorry. Now, I, I touched on the Euro. Maybe just jump over to the pound. Uh, we've got Carney speaking tomorrow after markets close, um, around 6 p.m., I believe. You know, he could have some things to say. Um, but overall, not too much to push the pound around until we get to Thursday, which is a busy day anyway with ECB. Uh, but we have UK retail sales on Thursday. Um, technically, as I see at the moment, I already highlighted this last week, and we're starting to see signs of this working now, today, is that we've got to pull back from this potential declining trend line here um, for a couple of days. But it was a pretty indiscriminate drop not exactly heavy selling going on there and um, what was notable is that we had an equivalent RSI trend line and that had actually broken so what I think we could be looking at here is the RSI gave us an early warning signal that price was going to break this trend line and, and maybe push up to this um, this peak in September you know uh, this is one of the kind of more valuable setups in the RSI sometimes it just looks a bit similar to price and doesn't tell you much um, but I think this is potentially uh, a good example of its usage. And obviously, we're above the 200-day moving average in the pound, um, but uh, you know, on a sort of weekly chart basis, we did make a lower low and made lower highs. 
Uh, but it was only just about a lower low, and I think it didn't actually close below. No, it didn't close as a lower low. So that's, um, you know, if you're looking at this weekly candlestick chart, which I'd always recommend doing, now is a fe essentially a false break. Because we broke below, and yes, on a daily chart we closed below it, but on a weekly chart we didn't. You know, that's the big, and that's the kind of big swings that we're dealing with. So that false break there has triggered this move up here, and um, you know maybe at the, the initial trigger for us to get a test right back up to this high, and this little false break of this downtrend line that we're talking about on the daily chart, I think could just be the next little minor trigger to get us back to get us finally there. Uh, but overall, uh, we've had this break of this declining trend line. You know, it was looking pretty bearish at this point, um, in, you know, in the 20th of September, but we couldn't do the break. So you know, as much as you wanted that to be a push, you know, a nice sell up the broken trend line down to the low, you know, you did first have to get through the, the previous low first, and we weren't able to conclusively on a closing basis, and hence we're pushing up again. So once we get up here. That's going to be this previous peak, and it's going to be another test of this trend line. That's going to be some pretty hefty resistance. Um, you know, but just the fact that it didn't work the first time, to me, suggests we're still just in a range-bound environment and could even get back up to the, the peaks around 158 again. I'll just, just notice the chat here when there's been a bit of a chat about um, time frame of charts. Um, so <coughs> I think in terms of, so I've been I've been discussing this from a sort of a weekly and daily perspective. Um, obviously those, those would typically not be the time frame charts that you use for day trading. And I know a lot of you out there will be day trading. Um, I think the way I would characterize the usage of this, um, the material that I present is, um, you know, you, it's really best to be tr uh, to be aware of these these longer term patterns and trigger points, and not to be on the wrong side of them. So if you're looking at a little, you know, if maybe you trade some particular indicator set up on a on a, on a one hour or four hour chart, um, you know, don't take a um, you know a return from an oversold level on the uh, st stochastic indicator on a four hour chart you know if you know as, as a buying opportunity um, if we're right at the resistance level as suggested on a uh, on a daily or weekly chart you know you're buying right into a resistance level so even though you've got that trigger there it's just less likely to work um, so th the traders that I speak to, um, the ones that have the best success are the ones that consider the daily time frames, uh, the, the weekly and daily time frames, and the, the more significant long-term levels that everyone's watching, and then they dig down to those uh, to those lower time frames if they have the time to do so, and um, and and more specifically take those little short-term opportunities in line with that longer-term picture. Now, obviously, not a lot of us do have time to go to those lower time frames if you're working all day it's pretty tricky to sort of split your mind across you know your day-to-day -day work and those short time frame trades that require a bit more attention um, now they're certainly worthwhile using those daily those shorter time frames but not if you don't have the time to do so you'll end up just um, you end up sort of taking trades without enough analysis you know you'll see something without having really studied it properly take the trade and then um, you know it could or could not work out but over a longer stretch of time you'll start to notice that you just you're missing things because you're sort of jumping in uh, and analyzing analyzing the market but not with enough time to do so that's certainly been my experience anyway um, but um, more power to you if you do have the time because um, you know, obviously, you can kind of what you can do is, you know, when I'm talking about a, um, you know, this trend line here, and perhaps it's uh, going to break, and it, to, to me it looks like it will. Um, you know, you can dip down to the four-hour chart, and um, and look for some short-term patterns to verify that it is in fact breaking, or, or give some specific buy triggers to justify that longer-term outlook. If you're just relying on the longer term, you know, you just have to kind of go by that and and come what may and you know hope it works out you've got a bit of extra um uh, a little extra confluence a little extra confidence if you have a short term buy signal to justify that
longer term pattern. Um, RSI, you know, you can really use it just the same in the one hour and four hour chart as you do the daily. It's just the same with all indicators. They're just less reliable on the short term. You get more false breaks in the short term, uh, more false indicator signals, but obviously you get more of them. So that's that's the um, you know that's the choice. Can you handle all these false breaks and the associated extra losing trades um, in order to get that higher number of trades? Bit of a uh, divergence there, but I hope that was useful. Um, yeah, while we're on the currency, he's got a little request for, for sterling yen. Could certainly have a look at that. Um, I know you ask for that a lot, Gordon, don't you? I should I should just add that to my um, my watch list here because I always just have euro yen. Don't have. Um, no, it's, it's just a good good point in general. I think is that um, there's obviously a lot of currency markets out there and. Unless you're trading on a very long-term basis, it's hard to cover all of them, and you just have to make cuts somewhere. And um, for some reason, pound, the pound yen just hasn't quite made made my cut, even though it is a nice volatile trade, uh, volatile pair to trade. Okay. So, <coughs> I'm sure you um, you have this line on there. So this this will be my first starting point. You know, we're getting some kind of breaks here, but still, it, it's holding quite well. This trend line, you can probably draw it in different ways. Um, so far, there hasn't been a particularly categoric break lower there's been a couple of false breaks and we're kind of holding in around this 50 day moving average and this rising trend line at the moment i guess if you if you change the trend line over to here you know we're looking um yeah we're looking good so i think that's what we're you know we've had a bit of a break of that that other longer term one which is something to be cautious of but we're holding this more interim trend line and uh you know, it's, it's kind of just a sideways market, a slightly uh, long bias sideways market. So, even though I think there's a, a, a risk of a, a breakdown, um, as we fell short of that 200 level, um, it's a big psychological level, obviously, that a lot of people are paying attention to. There's a risk that that finally did us in. Um, still, you know, you guys, you guys, you can, it's, it's not that this has to always hold weight, but on a macro basis, UK looks a lot more likely to be rising interest, raising interest rates than Japan. You know, uh, and there's there's speculation that um, Japan may actually increase the size of their their QE program, uh, which you know, if they were to announce that, that would be a uh, a massive surge and break of 200, I would imagine, in 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 sterling yen. So with that risk on the table, <coughs> I think there's only so far that people short the market would be willing to take. Sterling yen, and I would always be slightly biased to being on the long side, um, but it's obviously a bit of a choppy market. <coughs> now we're n near the lower end of the near the scale, um, coming off a slightly oversold kind of level. So, you know, move through 50, um, break through some you know the short-term resistances um, as you'd look on the daily chart. <coughs> you know, as we're approaching it here, um, entering a sort of breakout at this level. Um, you know, there's only I wouldn't really buy base too much off this broken trend line, but still it's a factor. Um, had a bit of a break that trend line. It's kind of this was, was a, a nice confluence of trend line retouches down here. We're moving off it, and it looks like we could get a break through this peak. Um, you know, break through this RSI. So a few factors to me suggesting we've got a bit more, a um, bit more room to the upside. But just the the MAs are pointing down, so it's um, you know kind of, you're kind of going against the um, the trend in the short term, if you like, just in in the belief that the kind of longer term rise is going to play out. Hope that helps. Um, so since I covered pound yen, I don't think I think similar similar factors at play with the dollar yen. Let's skip over to commodities. Now, gold, we're entering our third day of uh, declines here, and actually explains why uh, Rand Gold and Fresnillo, some of the, uh, the biggest mining companies for gold, 
our top decliners on the FTSE 100 today um, is because of this slight setback that gold has had in what has otherwise been a pretty great run. Um, I highlighted this channel um, a bit late, just after you know we had that pullback here. Thought, well, actually, that looks sort of you know you see that if you follow the markets enough, you see that bottom rising trend line, and you see a sort of pullback from a sort of slightly indiscriminate area. And you think, well, hold on, actually, that looks about equidistant. Whack in that um, channel pattern down here. You know, just one of the draw tools. It's quite nice to just draws two lines. You know, I'm sure you've seen it. Draws two lines together rather than having to sort of guess with two trend lines. <coughs> um, and it's, you know, it's playing out for the time being. So at the moment, we're dealing with this previous peak. Could get a rally off here. Certainly an opportunity in this area, but for me, maybe a slightly lower risk opportunity down at these these two peaks here, which is in the sort of, I think I made a note in the chart for them. There is about 152 to 157, yeah. Um, that sort of vicinity. And then if we get a drop that down through the, the trend line or through that low on October 8th, there they're you know, certainly not looking too, too good for gold at that point. You know, still the rising trend line could, could help, but um, the fact that we weren't able to get through the 200-day moving average for several days would be a pretty a negative sign and see a lot of people capitulate, I think. So, you know, this is the overall picture. You just always keep this trend, this, uh, trend in mind. We've sort of got a big... You know, try not to draw too much unnecessarily on the job. We've got a bit of a kind of sloping channel down there. Hasn't massively accelerated to the downside from that channel, um, and so still certainly scope to push up towards you know where that. Um, well, let me just draw it in for argument's sake. It's basically that. You know, there's a good chance we could push up here, which would be in sort of two, you know, one two fifty kind of area at a stretch, uh, depending on how quickly we get there. 1, 2, 40, maybe more conservatively, and these, these peepers peaks here that I had drawn him at uh, more like 1, 2, 30. You know, nothing really holding us back from, from doing that, other than, you know, just a slight worry that we're, you know, well below that 200 week. Um, you know, if we could push back through that 200 day, I think, you know, wouldn't be too difficult to get back up to this kind of, this kind of region. It, uh, it's distorted it slightly on the... Um, daily versus the weekly drawing. Um, so, so that you know, the big one, big ones as always with, with gold is, um, you know, it's really just the prospect of a, a US rate hike and, um, you know, any kind of turbulence in, in stock markets. We, um, it hadn't been working for a while as a safe haven, uh, but in the last um, bout of sell-off, uh, you know, it actually did work quite well. And obviously, we're getting a bit of a recovery in stocks at the moment, and gold is moving higher. So, a bit of an on-off relationship in terms of a safe haven, not all that reliable. But it's a, it's a factor. Obviously, the market's a bit nervous at the moment. Uh, but I would say probably the most significant factor is that we've scaled back when we think the U.S. Fed is likely to raise rates, and that's been weak, for, uh, you know, um, hitting the dollar and, and, and helping gold and silver. So talking of silver, let's have a little jump across to that. Uh, not much to say on this other than that we've got a little potential setup um, with some bearish RSI divergence um, in confluence with a declining... Do I need a weekly? No, yeah. Um, so a few ways you can draw this trend line, but uh, a very basic way would be connecting these two, these two larger peaks. And that's kind of where we are at the moment, that sort of vicinity. Uh, if you connect these two latest larger peaks, that would put us higher. So it's a risk to the upside that we push up to that again, given the fact that we would so many attempts to push below 14 failed. But, you know, it's still a generally, generally negative bias on the long term. And so slightly um, over the medium term, uh, lower, uh, you know, higher probability to, to sell than to, to buy, I would say. Um, but at the moment, um, got this little, this little specific trigger where the price has attempted a new high, but, um, failed to follow through in and around that declining trend line, and a lower high on the RSI. Um, so it could take us back down to that rising trend line. Having been also at the overbought level, so um, could take us back down to this this spike low around 15.40, um, perhaps down to what I think is 
the probably the the significant level within this kind of this little mess of few peaks here is about the fifteen twenty. And over to crude oil. Um, so obviously we're looking pretty positive when we broke out of the t this consolidation that took took forever um, during during uh, September. Looked good at the start of October. We just failed at that previous peak and um, I've dropped right back down. Um, you know, closed below this this area, which to me is a pretty negative sign, but managed to hold up with a little weekly uh, daily engulfing bullish pattern off the sort of lower level of uh, internal resistance there but um, you know not much to go by I think that was maybe the sort of 61.8 ish as well of that rise um, and but now we're starting to roll over again and um, so there's two levels for me on this uh, it's not too certain at the moment but if we close below 50 and close below 50 on the RSI turns the bias negative for a retest at the bottom of the range um, likewise, if we if we manage to close above 50 again and hold the RSI 50, you know that to me suggests the top of the range. But it's range trading conditions, obviously harder to call the market. We're right in the middle of the range at the moment, uh, and I would characterise the middle of the range as as 50 on both price and RSI. So I think that's um, that's about it for this week's charting analysis webinar. I hope that was useful. Um, you know, certainly feel free to get in touch with the, the company if you wanted any extra, if you had any extra questions. Um, I'm happy to field any extra questions outside of time on the webinar now, but I'm going to end the recording and, um, you know, certainly happy to chat after the webinar or obviously if you need to digest this first, just get in, cut, in touch with our customer service department and, you know, they'll, they'll be able to go into, in this, into uh, anything in more detail or can certainly pass any comments from you to me. So... Again, I hope that was useful. Good luck with trading this week. Um, definitely be interesting with the ECB and the Euro to see which way that eventually goes. Um, and, uh, you know, it could be a bit of a turning point for the, uh, the stock market were they to suggest any extra policy. I don't think they probably will, but it's certainly worth watching. All right, guys, thanks a lot. Just Law signing out.